Mr. Seth, oh my gosh. We had great announcements this morning. Lots of great stuff around Visual Studio, both 2019 and for the Mac. I've got Amanda and Uni here. Why don't you to introduce yourself so the friends out there in live stream land know who we are. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm Amanda Silver. I'm the Director of Program Management for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, uh, TypeScript, Windows Tooling, a whole bunch of different kinds of things. Hi, and I'm Munir Indranathan. I'm a Group Program Manager on the Visual Studio for Mac team. Awesome. So we've got great new releases folks can download for both versions right now and updates for VS Code. But what's new in VS for Mac? Right. So before we start about talking about VS for Mac, I just want to call out all the previews. I mean, the announcements today are all live. Are we highly encourage everyone to go try them out? Um, you know, here's our preview page. One of the things about Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac is we've made it such that you can install the preview releases alongside your production environment that's, and not mess up anything at all. Yeah, that's huge, right? Because I want to be testing. I want to know what the cool new things are that are coming without breaking those things I need to build on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep, and we tend to think of this as the foundation on top of which we'll start you know, publishing new features and updates regularly. We're really looking for some feedback on how things are going and you know, really really adjusting to that feedback. It's, it's our viewer's opportunity really to get their voice heard. If there's something that works great for them, we'll, we'll enable that, we'll enhance it. If it doesn't work great, maybe, maybe we don't yep. put as much into it. Yep. So one, one main goal of this release, Visual Studio 2019, was to make it easy for developers to get started on their code. Okay. The code could be anywhere. It could be on your machine. But more mm -hmm. likely, you're working with someone else in a source-controlled environment. That could be a repo on GitHub. It could be a Team Foundation version server you know, running Azure DevOps or anything like something like that. So we want to make it such that you can easily get started on your code. Okay. And for that, we have introduced a new uh, uh, experience to get started. Let me show you that first. Um, in Versary for Mac, uh, we have a new start window that lists all of the projects that, that you want to get started. Uh, so here I have some projects on my machine, mm -hmm. but I can always go to a repository, clone, and check out some code okay. and get started there as well. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go open something on my machine. Okay. Um, so so uh, here I have uh, an ASP.NET Core solution from a repo that I found somewhere on the internet. Uh, it has essentially, uh, this I think is the, is the demo. It's perfectly that, safe, isn't it, Uni? <laughs> this, perfectly safe. This I think is the demo that we used in our last Connect event, if okay. I'm not mistaken. Uh, I just didn't have access to our latest demos. Um, so here is the Smart Hotel website. It's mm -hmm. an ASP.NET Core front-end oh, application. I remember that demo, yeah. Yeah, okay. and that is backed by an Azure function that runs some serverless code to do some processing. Um, one major investment that we're making in Visual Studio for Mac in the next version mm -hmm. is to make our code reading experiences that much more reliable, fast, and fluid. Okay. Uh, we are actually rewriting the code editor from scratch, all using native Cocoa APIs okay. that allows us to give really fluent experiences uh, on, on the Visual Studio for Mac side. Combined with the work that we've done on Visual Studio, our language services that, that we're building for .NET, we believe we can provide a fantastic .NET coding experience on the Mac in this update. So you'll start seeing some of the improvements in the code editor you know, uh, appear over the next few previews. And I, I feel like that's a similar experience we've had with Visual Studio you know, 2019, 2017. And, and we've leveled up the performance of those code editors over time. Yep. And, and we're bringing that same knowledge now yeah. to VS for Mac and leveling it up based on some of those things we've learned in full Visual Studio. Yeah, I mean, historically, there was a lot of uh, duplication of efforts and so on and so forth. I believe that the work we're doing here allows us to bring value to customers, both sets of customers, almost instantly uh, across the two, two products. So here is an example of uh, a C-sharp file that I've opened. And I'm going to show you just a couple of minor things. Most of the, these innovations and improvements will start showing up in the next preview uh, for Visual Studio 2019. Um, so here we have uh, the light bulb experience. Mm -hmm. that's suggests a bunch of fix-ups. You could choose to sort of make an individual fix-up, or you could say, I want to fix a whole bunch of code issues together. Uh, if you choose the fix-all option, we provide you with a dialog that shows you all possible suggestions that you could act on. You could choose to select an individual suggestion. We'll show you a preview of the, the, the issue the in your change. code and the fix-up, yeah. and then you can go make that change, per se. So uh, we want to make it possible for you to detect issues and fix issues uh, very quickly in your code.
Visual Studio for Mac has always had support for uh, you know source control, I'm but sure. one major investment we're doing in the next version is to sort of rewrite our source control support as well. We will have support not just for uh, you know Team Foundation version control, but definitely GitHub and oh, yeah. every Git, Git scenario as well. So source control is another major investment that we're making in Visual Studio for Mac. And finally, um, the, uh, we have always had capabilities that allow developers to publish to Azure uh, and various other web endpoints. Okay. We're making investments into that space as well. So for example, uh, we just recently added you know, uh, the ability to not, not just publish to Azure, but to a folder. So you can then copy and deploy the code to your favorite server. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. have support, we just added support for Azure Functions 2.0. So you can create a new Azure function and set up your trigger. So here's an example where I'm adding uh, a new function. We have a rich wizard experience that lets you configure the function, uh, lets you want to create a trigger. Yeah. And so As an IDE user, I love having that hand-holding experience that gets me from, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing, right through the wizard and published tremendous. Great to see that in yeah. Visual Studio. Definitely want to take away the complexity from you and make it really simple to make it, make it possible for you to publish to Azure. So that's mm -hmm. something we're doing here as well. Let the experts take care of that complexity for me. Yep. So I Absolutely. can focus on my knowledge. Absolutely. Awesome. Amanda, do you want to show some of the things you have in the Sure, show? yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so I just want to kind of reiterate some of the things that, that Uni was talking about, but in the context of the Visual Studio for Windows uh, oh, yeah. uh, version. So this, what you see on the screen right now is actually the Visual Studio installer screen. And I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for anybody who works uh, at Microsoft, you know, we're constantly installing both the latest release and kind of uh, the internal nightly Previews, builds. Previews, dog food. Right, exactly. Oh, yes. So what you see here on my installer is that I actually have two internal builds. I have one for the latest uh, Visual Studio 2017 update as well as the 2019 preview. But this is basically the same exact experience that an external user would get. It's okay. just they wouldn't see the little int there. Okay. Um, but I needed to get this to get all the demos ready. I had to use the, the previews. Uh, I wasn't wasn't going to you know risk it by installing everything this morning. So so, so I can I can start installing that and do that on do Visual Studio 2019 on my stream later this week next week and we can start live coding on Twitch today. Yeah today. Oh, yeah man. yeah yeah. I mean oh. what's really great about this is you know when I when I talked to the, in fact I was just talking with the development team and yeah. they were talking about their process for adopting new tools and typically what they do is they you know pick pick a couple of developers on their team to kind of go scout it. Mm. Right, and so those devs do maybe a little project to kind of go see what the tool looks like and come back and do a report for the rest of the team. Um, but this makes it really easy because you know it used to be that you had to have kind of like a burner machine uh, because yes. you were too worried about it corrupting your developer environment. Oh, yeah. But now that we have the channels and we've done all of the work to kind of make sure that they can be updated independently, um, you're really not at risk to to corrupt your your dev box. Good. Oh yeah. my gosh, good. So that's kind of that's thing one that's super cool. So now let's jump into 2019 itself. So as uh, Uni was talking about a minute ago. Uh, we have the start window. Um, so you can see, just like he showed in the Visual Studio for Mac experience, we also have a start window experience. And and really, there are two reasons that we did this. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is for, for users who are absolutely brand new to Visual Studio, and possibly users who are new to your development team, for example, okay. um, they, we've gotten feedback that they are just drowning in complexity when they see the entire uh, IDE. They kind of don't know where to start. There's that intimidation of the blank screen. Yeah. You and open I, it up and it's just that gray background. It's just, there's just a lot. It's not just yeah. the blank screen. I mean, we have the start page, but, but even the start page, there's just a lot of, of information density. Um, that's in there, and to be able to absorb all of that is is kind of intimidating your first time out. Okay. Um, the other thing that we heard from a lot of more more senior and experienced developers is basically that that the uh, you know Visual Studio when it was originally designed, uh, you probably remember this. You had to get you know go to Best Buy and get uh, you know twelve discs and yes. stuff. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yes. And, but the but the result of that was that uh, that not only was the product entirely contained in there, but all of the documentation and all of the templates were were contained in there. Oh, so yeah. it was really this like self-contained you know package to start your development. We, 
And we, you used will, to, yeah. we used to get sandwich boxes to store those discs in right. so that we could carry them around because we were, we were in They're college. They're all collector's items now, don't they? Oh, uh, but there were also knew. the books that came with it. I mean, you had like the whole, the whole getup was not just your machine. It was the entire, you know, physical oh, yeah. uh, aspect of it. You had a kit <laughs> that you brought with you. This is my Visual Studio kit. <laughs> but oh, now, nowadays, uh, what we find for modern development teams is that their startup experience, like when you're getting started on a new project or when you're a new developer joining a team, for the most part, they don't necessarily use our templates that are in box. They actually start with an online hosted repo, right? And so what we're trying to do with the new start window is to make it so that it's a lot easier to kind of get started with an online hosted repo and that that's kind of the most predominant experience that we sure. encourage you to to use. Right? Sure, because my team members, new team members, they're, I want to point them, here's where we keep our code, go start over there. Right, exactly. And I think, I think you know, once you start to curate what, what kind of feeds you look at and other things like that, this is going to become really, really useful. But let's go ahead and, and actually try that. So let's okay. clone or check out a, a repo. Um, so I'm just going to copy this one. Oops. <laughs> copy that and come back here and just uh, let's clone it. And I forgot to delete this, so we will just call this Desktop Taters 3 and clone it. Not like you've practiced this once or <laughs> twice, right? Yeah. Not at all. No, not, not all. apparently not enough. <laughs> um, so what you can see here is that this is actually using the Team Explorer to actually connect to that GitHub context um, and to actually clone that locally in this in this particular box, right? So now you can see that it opens in, in a solution in a folder view, but I just need to click this solutions and folders mm. to actually pick which solution I want to take a look at. So now that I'm I'm in this context, um, you can see that I'm actually loading the solution uh, with the WPF project itself uh, loaded right here. So so that's pretty cool. The other thing that you might see here is this little thing on the left right here, which says projects are loaded and ready to use. Background tasks are still running. What's it doing in the background? Yeah, so what we're really trying to do with Visual Studio 2019, I mean, I think a lot of people have seen in 2017 that there have been pretty dramatic performance improvements, oh, right? Oh, yeah. We've seen those numbers, those demos where, oh, time to load the, the Roslyn source code, right? Yeah, yeah, and live unit testing is dramatically yes. improved. Mm -hmm. um, so. What we've been trying to do is to move more things to be asynchronous and out of process in the in Visual Studio itself. Okay. And so what you're All seeing right. here is that there are some things that are still running in the background, um, but that the project you can actually go forward with. You don't have to wait for anything before you actually kind of go ahead and, and get things going. So is it doing things like looking at my NuGet packages or, or any of those Sure, Roslyn I mean, tasks? it's doing any kinds of things that it needs to do to initiate the, initiate the project. But basically, as soon as uh, the project is loaded, the source code is loaded, and basically, you know, we think it's safe for you to type. In other words, you will get the IntelliSense experience you need and the background uh, compilation experience you need, then we'll notify you to say, hey, go for it. But, but in the background, we'll still do some other things to kind of get, get everything primed. So I can go open a Razor template or open a WinForm designer yeah. and start tinkering around in there while those other things are Right, happening. and anything that you really push forward because you want to do it immediately, mm. it'll obviously push that to the top of the queue and, and make sure that that's the priority. <sighs> Yeah, okay. it's kind of amazing how much Visual Studio really is a an OS inside of an OS, yeah, but uh, it's a pretty complex app. Oh my gosh, yes. yeah. So <laughs> I, I want to make sure that our friends out there that are watching the live stream that you know we're answering your questions on Twitch. If you have questions about the new Visual Studio, whether it's 2019 Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio for Mac, send us your questions out there in the Twitch chat room and we'll answer them here for you while we're going through the demos yeah, here with sure. Amanda and Uni. So the other thing that you'll notice here is that the... Um, the top level menu bar has actually been collapsed. And part of the mm. reason that we've been doing that is so that you have basically more room for your code. So if we go ahead and we load like the main view model and you can see it, you know, this is a pretty small resolution. It's not something that I would ever actually work in. This is the, the only reason we're doing this is for the live audience. But I love working on my laptop. <laughs> Come on, Amanda. But I mean, in this context, it really highlights how helpful it is to have, you know, yet another a uh, uh, menu bar that that you know it's gone. that's that's a whole line of code right there right at least. so <laughs> at least having right? another line of code in my in my view is actually super super useful 
Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing that you'll notice is up here in the corner, I have kind of my information about my profile. Mm -hmm. And then I also have live share, which I'll, I'll use in a second. But the idea here is that we want to take all of the static information about your presence and the context of who you collaborate with and kind of put that up there in the right-hand corner. Um, the other thing that you'll notice down here is that we actually have the coupon reader WPF on the, on the lower right-hand corner. Um, so we can actually see that along with the, the repo that we're in um, and kind of which branch we're in in GitHub, how many changes I've made, things like that. And then you can also see down here in the lower right-hand corner, we have kind of like a, a checksum that basically says, hey, everything's compiling. But as soon as I were to make an edit and things wouldn't compile, that would go to red or yellow, depending on if it's warnings. Okay. Um, but that kind of tells me whether, like, the state of my, the health of my code that's in my, in my code editor. Yeah, I used to use an extension that, that our friend Mads Christensen wrote that would put a little, a little watermark in the background to indicate mm -hmm. if there was errors or yeah, something. Yeah, so Mads is on the team, so a lot of his great <laughs> ideas actually come directly into Visual Studio eventually, right? Awesome, okay. The other thing that we've uh, also been trying to do, kind of along the lines of the fact that, that some of our new developers are telling us that they're overwhelmed by the capabilities that Visual Studio has, is we're really trying to improve discoverability, right? Oh, yeah. And so, um, um, so one of the things that we've been working on a lot is improving the search experience inside of Visual Studio. Okay. So for example, I could do something like search for a refactor, and you could see all these different refactorings come up. And it's not just you know various different refactorings that are available, and it would change context based on what was highlighted, um, but also the hotkeys. Right? Yeah. So what's going what's super cool, and this is coming in the next preview, is okay. you're going to be able to actually launch a command directly from the from the search itself. So so right. I can just right. with with normal no no mousy mousy, I can do typey typey. And <laughs> and you don't know the shortcut keys, but I yeah, want to you don't do know. Right. Right. And, Go find it's, this. But it's not just it. it's not just it's not just a, a text command. Um, it's also like I could, for example, search for Android, right? And I could see, oh, there's, first of all, all these Android settings. Mm. There might be some new uh, new project templates. Like I could say, um, what is it, um, tvOS or something like that? What is it? iOS, like I could search for that. You could see, you know, various capabilities oh, that I yeah. might have. I don't have Xamarin installed on this particular one. Yeah. Um, but I could do go to definition, and you'll see that it's it's not it's not like perfect, right? Because I don't have a space in there. Um, it's all fuzzy matching. Um, and over time, this will get better and better and better and better because it's a hosted service. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. So let me uh, let me show you one more thing, which is okay. uh, which is uh, live share in this context. So again, I'm showing you a WPF application here, right. right? And so what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to invite Uni, who's over here on the Mac, oh, yeah. uh, to to basically do a live share for this for this project. Okay. So wait, wait, wait. You're going to take a WPF app, right? Now, is this .NET Core 3? It's .NET Core 3 WPF app. OK. Yeah. And I mean, a Mac doesn't run WPF, right? Because right? it's Windows Presentation Foundation. Right. But he's going to be able to work with the code. He's going to be able to work with the code. So let's try it. All right, so let's try it. So let's, we're going to set up a every, split screen Should here. everything go well? <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go to the right. And then we're going to dock Uni to the left. Yep. And I just need to copy that. I haven't sent it to you yet, Uni, so don't freak out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to paste that there. And so he should be able to join. Great. So in my Teams window, I'm seeing the link. Just with a single click, I can open up VS, live sh VS Code with live share running in it. Yeah. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, let me just try it once. one more time. Amanda, can you see? Oh, let me just uh, click your link. Yeah, and let's, get, let's make sure you're docked to the left side there. These are preview bits. <laughs> so please excuse us if. Is it working? Let's try it again. Uh, can you send me a new link, please? Uh, sure. Share it again. Share it again. Mm -hmm. Let's try that one more time. You can close your browser and try it one more time. All right. The other thing you can do is copy it into your your um, VS Code instance. One last. Time. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That looked good, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh no. There seems to be an issue with the extension. Okay. But let's just walk through the scenario. Okay. Okay. So, um, so basically what would happen is if he wants to join in, then basically he can just go ahead and jump into the WPF session 
and actually be able to uh, to debug this this session. So you're debugging on on the Windows machine, and yeah. he's able to connect in and see all the debugging information, the locals, run watches, right. and inspect as as you would be on the Windows machine, but from VS Code, whether it's on Mac or right. Windows. Right, exactly. I just sent you a different link, so let's try that right. one more time. Looks like it was updating an extension or something. Let's okay. try it. Let's see if this works. OK. Uh... So if you go to the live share uh, viewlet there, um, you can click on Join Collaboration Session, and then just enter the URL there. All right, let's try that. Let's hope this works. OK. So yeah. uh, it looks like it's, it's joining. It'll <clears throat> take just a second to actually join the session. It'll give me a notification as soon as he's in. So this actually is, says, OK, Uni's in. There we go. Yeah, so, when, so what's really cool about this, and let me see if I can kind of scroll back out to, ah. Oh, we got zoomed trying in. Trying to zoom in, and now I'm trying to zoom back out. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, there, now we can see some real code. It's that two fingers <laughs> zooming on the touchpad. So, um, so uh, you can actually see some of my, uh, some of my highlights in here. Uni can see it in the, in the context of his uh, Visual Studio Code instance. Um, but what's really cool is I've actually uh, I can actually allow Uni to do some debugging on his machine. So what he can do is and just, it should, we should yeah. clarify. I don't have the code on the machine, right? Sure. It's all coming it's all being from a machine. He doesn't let's have the sure Windows SDK. And let's make sure yours right? is snapped on the yep. left side there yep, for yep. everybody. Uh, let me just move. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Makes the debug window really small, but let's try. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to the WPF application, uh, and I'm going to start debugging. So again, the app is not running on my machine. It's going to run her, on her machine, and we can work on this together. So you're the requesting the, the requesting the debug. It's going to come over to to this machine. That's oh, right. Mandos. And all right, traffic all right, that try. back and forth. Okay. So I'm going to launch, and if you look yep. at look at that in, on a, so a Mandos screen. Yeah, you can see that both of our machines are actually launching into a debug state. Hmm, that's that's odd. We're getting a compile error, um, but I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, Let's try it one more it's time. Hard to see it. <laughs> can you do uh, okay. clean? Um, you can try that. And, and you can see on my screen, I'm seeing the same build outputs, including, unfortunately, in this case, errors. <laughs> just in case this was to work correctly, I would be able to just run this app from my machine, put a breakpoint, all without Amanda doing anything, get the complete IntelliSense experience and debug through that. And, and this, is part of, this is part of live streaming and live TV is sometimes things <laughs> air out, and that's OK. Yeah. But this actually opens up to a pretty good question while we're trying to figure this out. Um, from our friend Steam Jockey in the chat room asked, well, how does, how does Visual Studio Live Share communicate? If, if you're on a tight firewall framework, uh, firewall network, what kind of communications should they expect? Is, is it using something like an IM, instant messaging back and forth? Uh, so actually, what's happening is that that it it uh, uses an Azure Relay service. So okay. this is a service that's available in Azure uh, to basically create a connection, and then once that's done, then it's just uh, then it's just basically peer to peer. So and if I'm on a tight firewall network, right, where tight uh, restrictions on our private network, can I just do direct connections without connecting out to Azure? Uh, so yes. So so. Uh, what that's one thing that we're working on over time. So, so uh, basically, you have to have the Azure Relay uh, service itself to do the initial handshake. Okay. But beyond that, then you can actually work in a then firewall context. Yeah. As only awesome. the amazing Amanda Silva could do it. <laughs> she was talking to you and debugging and fixing the problem at the same time. You know. We're so. professionals. <laughs> we can yeah. make things happen. Uh, so, look, so here the app is running. We got lucky. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to put a breakpoint. And I'm going to actually, uh, you know, you can see the app is running. Sure. I'm going to put a breakpoint. And uh, let's go ahead and like click the refresh button. Yeah, you ready to refresh? Yep. So this is a WPF application again. And look, we're actually hitting the breakpoint in my context, right? Right. As well as his context. And, and I can see everything as well, right? So here is my breakpoint. Yeah. Let me go ahead and make a small code change. In this case, I'm just going to add a WPF. You can see I'm getting the full IntelliSense experience inside Visual Studio Code for the app that's running on a machine. Uh, I'm going to call it system.windows.messagebox.show. I'm going to just call it hello world for now. 
Um, and and I'm going to run it, right? Yep. We're good? This uh, is, uh, and when the app runs, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you like, can see the Hello World just popped up. So he just did an edit and continue on his VS for Mac machine. Mac. Yeah, right in the context of our, our live debugging session. Okay, that that's that's pretty impressive. Pretty cool, huh? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. I mean, editing continue alone, right, is is pretty cool by myself. But to be doing that handoff back and forth, there are so many things that I could see folks wanting to be able to do that with, whether it's Windows Forms, WPF, or whatever other framework we support. Yep. Right, there's other programming languages yeah. out there. In a, yeah. in a team setting where people are constantly switching contexts. It'd be so much more work for me to go ask her about the repo, get the code on my machine. In this case, I couldn't even do that, but let's assume I'm working on a different kind of application, and then debug through it. Right. This oh, is yeah. her problem. She set it all up. I'm just helping her, and that was really, really powerful. So Great why don't stuff. we take some questions for oh, a second? Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, there's a, a really good question here about multiple screens. Mm -hmm. If I'm using Visual Studio across multiple screens, if they have different DPI settings, Ooh. You're Some, in for a treat. Yeah? Yeah. I have this problem at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is actually something that we've been taking on for Visual Studio 2019. Okay. And uh, the first preview should so show some progress, but the second preview will show pretty dramatic progress. Fantastic. Yeah, so so everything should start to get pretty crisp in yeah. the course of I've, Visual I've, Studio 2019. I've got that 4K display on my laptop, and when I drag over to the side screen that's 1080, yeah. everything gets old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've been oh. working on it. So it's coming. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Now. What kinds of performance improvements have we put into live unit testing? Oh, well, I mean, there's, first of all, test discovery itself is pretty dramatic. It used to be a uh, uh, order n kind of uh, uh, algorithm, mm. and now it's basically a linear algorithm. Okay. So, um, so it's, that's a pretty dramatic improvement. We have other demos that we've done in the past that show that you can load 50,000 live unit tests uh, in the course of a few seconds. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh man, I'm gonna know immediately when I break my build. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, uh, we improved uh, in, uh, doing a, a stash and kind of a switch branch uh, pretty dramatically, and that was actually in 2017, but a recent update of 2017. Okay. Okay. So that's those are a couple things. Um, solution load time has also been dramatically improved. As sure. Well. Because we've got that async. Yeah. Loading process. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Walter in the chat room is asking, does the team debugging with LiveShare work with distributed developers in different cities or countries with relatively slow internet connections? Ab absolutely. So that actually was uh, one thing that, that we've really been trying to work on. I mean, in some ways, the, the important thing about it is that the entire context of the debug session is not going into uh, the, the network, right? The only thing that actually goes into the traffic yeah. is is commands, oh. right? So it's really, it's not like the debugging because it's being hosted on your machine. Sure. It has the compute power of your machine. Okay. We don't okay. need the compute power of the network, right? Okay, you're just and trafficking. And so all it is is, is remoting of your commands. Oh, That's man. the only thing that actually goes over the network, right? Okay. And then if there's new information that you might find in, like, let's say, a debug inspection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, an expression evaluation or something like then that. Then it's just that information. It's just that information. So it's okay. actually really, really small, which is oh. pretty awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I can run it now over my 3G phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are we doing anything to improve Test Explorer integration for Xamarin apps? Uh, Dot Morton is asking. Uh, yeah, you want to? I think there's a very studio question. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we've definitely been improving the test discovery and the live unit testing experience. Um, I don't know that there's anything specifically that we're doing for for Test Explorer integration for Xamarin applications that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but but it's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question here. This might, I think, lead into your next demo. Yeah. Uh, AGRTGA. That's yeah. a That's a great handle there. <laughs> um, are we going to get the option to either debug multiple projects or at least choose the project with the diagnostics tool window? Uh, yes. So that's actually something that I'll demo tomorrow at Dev Intersections. Ah. Uh, <laughs> ah so but, if you're here local yeah, in Vegas yeah. joining us. Yeah, but I don't sure have the demo ready to go today. But I have okay. something that's super cool. So about <laughs> debugging projects. Yeah. Right? So yeah, um, exactly. debugging experience has been getting better. It has been getting better. And one of the things I really wanted to show, because there wasn't a lot of love that was shown in the keynote for C++, is we've actually dramatically improved the C++ debugging experience. OK. Yeah. So, oh, talk to me about so, that. So I'm playing a little bit of a video here because this actually is a um, 
a, an app that is a little bit too big for this machine. I actually, it it's, takes it's like an a, app. Yeah, it's called Gears of War. That's not uh, an app. Oh my <laughs> gosh, Amanda. So we've been working with the Gears of War team to uh, to make sure that their debugging experience is much better. Yeah. And so one of the things that really prevented Visual Studio from successfully uh, being able to kind of make their debug process really smooth yeah. is that everything was in process. And so because everything was in process, it actually consumed a lot of memory, right? And so sure. what we'll show you here is actually the experience um, in visuals in the previous version of Visual Studio. This is, you know, basically without the out-of-proc debugging experience. But what you can see is um, this is attaching to the process. And as we start to step through and inspect some things, you'll see that the memory really starts to creep up. Um, it's a little bit fuzzy here, but it's such a cool feature that I just couldn't help but show it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, uh, just the idea of, all right, let's 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 debug a AAA game. Game, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Yeah, um, and not everybody gets access to the Gears of War source no. code. So um, so what you can see here is uh, this is actually, you know, we have it, we're stopped at a breakpoint. But further, when we start to do inspection of various variables, uh, DevM, the, the in-memory, just starts to kind of creep up and up and up. And we're at about 1.2 at this point. We oh. haven't done any inspection. We haven't done any steps. Yeah, um, yeah. And now we're doing a couple steps and as you can see it just continues to grow and grow and grow and eventually you're, you end up with an out of memory situation which is really really um, problematic because by that point you're probably deep into the gameplay mm -hmm. um, to debug and repro the issue and so getting back into that state is is kind of challenging it, and, it, and it throws you completely off of your groove you were so focused on getting something done and now yeah out of memory yeah okay. exactly so I'm going to just uh, forward this a little bit, and you'll see that that we kind of end up with you know 1.97 or something like that. But now you can see we're going to try it again, and there's an option that you have to go to um, that will let you run the uh, debug symbols in an external process. Okay. And today that works for C++ only, but that's something that'll come down the road for other languages as well. Got to start somewhere. Um, yeah, exactly. But now you can see this is Visual Studio 2019. You can see the nice uh, indigo kind of blue theme here. Again, this is Gears of War. And we're just basically going to execute the same exact kind of debugging process. Um, but what you'll see here is that the, the memory doesn't creep up this time. Yeah, yeah it looks like it's it's staying there about, f what, 470, 472? Come yeah. on. Yeah, exactly. So now we're just debugging the exact same thing, and it just isn't, it's not growing, right? So, and that's because it's basically out of, it's attaching to the debugger out of process. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That is amazing. And we just made C++ uh, live share support available as well. That's right, oh. yeah. So that's that's really cool. So, uh, okay. so with C++ live share, like you can basically, if somebody has a, hey, it's reprowing on my machine, but I can't get it on your machine, you can invite them to a live share session. The debugger is working out of proc. It's, it's kind of, a, as, as Scott Guthrie likes to say, it's a great day to be a developer. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You've taken the works on my machine and say, here, just connect right. in and try right. it. Right, exactly. Um, Boomy, LOL, in the chat room. Um, kudos for you, Amanda. Super cool. Thank you, Boomy. <laughs> we appreciate that. And we agree. <laughs> yes, we absolutely agree. This is amazing. So now I'm going to get untangled, because there's one last thing I want to show you that I think somebody was actually asking about. I I think I did see that question a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, so somebody was asking about the experience for uh, reviewing PRs yeah, directly. Yeah, I hate that context shift that I have to do where I'm going to my web browser and then back to yeah, Visual Studio. Yeah, I mean, especially for senior developers who are bombarded by pull request reviews all the all the all day basically or live streamers who are trying to run a show <laughs> and then they get then they end up with uh, pretty doing shallow reviews because they can't use the tools that they're familiar with yes so what we've been doing is working with the github team to create an integrated experience inside of visual studio and visual studio code yeah. uh, so that you can actually review your pull requests right in the context of the tools that you're used to but this is such a cool demo. Like this is something that got cut from the keynote that okay. I'm so excited about that I had to show it today. Okay. So, so so folks on Twitch, make sure you get your get your clips ready so we can get some clips of this. We can share out to Twitter and like that. All so right. So this is this is the the normal GitHub extension that you can get on the extension gallery today. Okay. Um, plus a little magic 
that we're of some a preview of something that we're working on. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you when the magic shows up. Um, but if I go to all, you can see all of the pull requests that are awaiting my review, cool. right? So that's that's pretty cool. Time to get back to the office. I can, yeah, I know, right? They <laughs> they need me. Um, but I can go ahead and inspect one of these pull requests, and you can see that it brings the context of all of that locally into my machine. And so you can see in my Solution Explorer, I actually have nothing loaded. Mm. Um, this is all actually being hosted in a cloud context. So so I can you know, go ahead and look at one of these uh, files here. And you can see that I get all of the, the code colorization that I'm expecting. Yeah. But not only do I get that, I also get like hover tips, for example, over, okay. The, okay. over the data types. And um, I get the, the, the documentation. Um, I also get the, the analyzer. So I have uh, ESLint running here, that's a static analyzer that's telling me that this is assigned to a value but variable but has never been used, right? So that's, that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, so the other thing that I can do is look at, let's go look at this other one. Um, oh, I forgot to show you something here, um, which is that if I do a find all references on this, you can see that it's going to find all references of that grid legend thing, not just for those uh, those mentions that are in this file, but also for mentions of grid legend that are in files that aren't in this PR. Okay, so I mean, you're you're blowing my mind here because these are things that I struggle with when I look at those GitHub PRs and I'm looking at just the text in the web browser. Now I've got the full context of everything, and I can really explore. And you and can get my use your hotkeys, and you see the diff yeah. view, and yeah, exactly. So that's super super cool. So let's let's take a look at the other one. Um, so this, this particular pull request, it looks like, is introducing a new dependency on an NPM package mm. that I'm unfamiliar with, right? Okay. And so, um, so any time that anybody introduces a new dependency, I really want to understand more about what that dependency is doing, right? And so, um, so what I'm going to do is do a go to definition on one of the types that's defined in this new NPM package, right? OK, OK. But this NPM package is just picked up as an NPM package. It's not the source isn't included in my re in my pull request. Yeah, I don't I don't see a package right. JSON there that will right. point me to it. And it's not even in my project. It's just a N NPM depend, right? OK. Um, so what do you think is going to happen if I do a go to definition? OK, it's not going to choke and say, oh, I don't know where this is, or a file night found type right. of error. Right, I mean, right? that would be like the obvious thing. Another thing that it could do is have a minified TypeScript, a fi minified JavaScript file, which would be like what would happen in deployment, Stop right? Stop it. Yeah, but, but what's actually going to happen, if I do go to definition here, is it's going to observable.ts. This is the actual source code of the NPM package on GitHub. It found it. Yeah, it found it. Okay. So now, basically what this is doing is it's understanding the dependency that you have yeah. and mapping it back, back to the actual source repo where that source is, is defined. Oh my gosh. So this okay. is indexing all of the code on, on GitHub. Yeah. So that you can you can start to traverse these things. Wow. Now, does that work with just JavaScript and TypeScript or will it work with my it's .NET gonna, code it's also? It's going to work for everything. So um, yeah, so one of the things that's super cool here is not only can I do a one hop into observable.ts, but I could also go to another one, do another go to definition on another file, and this is now opening yet another file that's wow. defined in, in GitHub. Wow. Yeah. Now, Martz is asking in the chat room, does this work for Azure DevOps PRs as well? Not just the dependency lookup, but the... Yeah, so we actually have a great extension that's very similar for Azure DevOps PRs that also allow you to do the review. Terrific. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And then can I do this from the Team Explorer window? Uh, well, so this, so the GitHub one shows up in the GitHub window gotcha. itself, but the but the Azure DevOps one I think shows up in the Team Explorer. In the Team Explorer. Yeah. Great. Thanks for the question, Martz. Um, and then I've got one more question that I want to come to here from Zamcat. We saw live uh, live share. Does that also work with Xamarin projects? Yeah, it sure does, Uni. Yeah, I, it does. Uh, the one part that we didn't show with client applications, one of the challenges is that. Imagine that Amanda is sitting in, I don't know, Redmond, and I'm sitting in Vegas. Sure. How do we debug this? Can we see the screen, right? Because that's really important. Yeah. The one part that we didn't show today that's right. is that uh, live share will also allow you to like sort of uh, cast your screen. 
or the application. Okay, you know? so I've yeah. seen that with, with ASP.NET Core where I can share my server. But you could do it with a WPF application now. So what we weren't able to set up Uni's Bits today, okay. but Hanselman showed it in his keynote. Yeah. Uh, if I have a WPF for WinForms application on my Windows machine and I'm, I'm doing a live share session with somebody on a Mac machine or an Ubuntu uh, machine, they can also see the app. Oh man! So and so that'll eventually yeah. come for mobile apps as well. Yeah, absolutely, it, it yeah. just traffics the UI yeah. over to to the Mac. Right. I mean, oh. it's the, just the H win, right? In this sure. case, it could be the emulator that we send across. Oh right. my so, gosh! So. I am <laughs> so looking forward to Visual Studio 2019 and these updates. I got to get it installed. Now we have a download link for that. Moderators, can you do me a favor? We know the, the download link. Can you paste that link into the chat room so that all our friends out there that are watching, absolutely. they can go and download the latest updates for VS for Mac and Visual Studio 2019 Preview 1. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Uni and Amanda. It, I've, I've learned a ton here. Now, I'm going to start using Visual Studio 2019 on my next stream. i got to get that installed and up and running. Awesome. But I'm going to start walking over here. I'm going to head over to the other set because Ed Thompson's over here, and he's going to help me with something else on my stream, all right? Awesome. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you. Thank Jeff. you Thanks so much. Us. All right. So